Mugello is one of the newer offerings on iRacing, and yet it's quickly seen lots of use in a variety of series. With the Lotus savoring long, fast, sweeping corners, this place is going to feel like it was special made for this car. But who can wield this lovely combo the best? We'll find out soon as we get ready to watch round two of the Lotus 79 Sunday Grand Prix Series, and you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Hi, I'm Joe Peek, and joining me in the booth is Roush Racing driver Joey Atterbury. Behind the scenes is our director, Daniel Costello, and he's using cameras provided by Dougie Beard. Mugello has garnered more attention lately, but in case you're in the dark, let's shed some light on this track. Welcome to Autodromo Internazionale del Mugello. Only an hour north of Florence and owned by motorsport royalty Ferrari, this is a popular Italian track. With a short layout consisting of seven turns and the GP layout having 15, the full length runs about three and a quarter miles or five and a quarter kilometers. It weaves through the Italian hills with pretty much nothing but long sweeping corners. It makes for spectacular views for spectators and drivers, but difficulty in nailing overtakes. The main spot for that will be into the first corner of San Donato. From there, a climb up through a series of corners that switch back and forth eventually plunges down through Casanova and Savelli. This is where speeds pick up greatly, and the compression up through the first Arabiata brings you to the blind crest of the second. Things finally slow back down just a bit with two final hairpins at Corrientale and Buccini. Make sure you get the exit right on that last one. It's more than a kilometer run down the main straight. This track was built in 1973, but has seen continual improvements and has hosted the Italian Grand Prix for motorcycles for many decades. In recent times, it finally saw an official round of the Formula One Championship in 2020. With the virtual version now arriving on iRacing, fans from around the globe can experience this breathtaking romp around the Italian countryside. As you can see, there's some incredible views amongst the Italian hills here, but the drivers, Joey, are going to be much more focused on the track. Absolutely. 15 turns, 3.259 miles in length, and actually quite a bit of elevation change here at Mugello. Your best passing opportunity, definitely down into San Donato, also known as turn number one. I mean, look at how long that front straightaway is. So we're going to see some varying top speed differences between the downforce levels. And then I counted them. This track has six different switchbacks. Turns two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 11, and 13 and 14. So you better get used to those change of directions from the left to the right around this place. And then really from Casanova all the way down into the Arabiata's corners, that's downhill. Arabiata 2, I believe that is the lowest point on the track. And then it climbs all the way up the hill. The final turn, turn number 15, it seems like it lasts forever. It is also downhill. It seems like it's falling away from you. The corner exit is the most important corner on this track as it leads out onto that long front straightaway. We're going to see lots of different car setups here today, Joe. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating for sure. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. But first, we want to go over the championship, which is pretty simple because it's uh, basically how they finished last race. And Juan Costa is looking like he's going to be tough to beat. He is back today. Anti Lepisto going to try his best to hold him honest. And Gernot Frisia is here once again. He's been looking like he's picked up the pace somewhat, although he had a bit of a bad start last round uh, that uh, he had to climb back to that third place. So hopefully he has a, a better beginning to the race to give us a, a better fight up at the front. Jack David Spickett been showing up more and more in all the different vintage cars has kicked things off with a fourth with Freckleton at a top five as well. But we've also got an F2 championship with that they uh, run in this series. Joey, why don't we go over that? And since we've only had the one week, it is exactly how they finished in those results. It is Andy Hugel currently leading the way. Sammy Juvenen here in second place. Sebastian Zahul in third. Thomas Silbernagel in fourth. Jess Moore in fifth. I see a lot of familiar names with Daniel Gallus, Patrick Samaran, Shady Ahmad, Kurt Clapper. Ben Summers is one that I don't recognize, as well as a couple in here, Joe. Jess Moore, I, I don't recognize. So I'm curious how many of these drivers are going to stick around for the full F2 point standings and if we get some of these new names as regulars. 
Yeah, I'd love to see some fresh faces come in here. And these faces are going to be racing for 26 laps for today's event uh, round two. Open setup, as we heard Joey mention. So do you put a lot of downforce in to be uh, quick through all the various turns, the long turns around here? Or do you try and make it fast in a straight line so you can hopefully make some passes down that main straight? They don't have a spare car if they run into problems. There is quite a bit of runoff in places, but those switchbacks means it's going to be easy to tangle with one another if you do get side by side. Drive through penalty at 17 incidents and a DQ at 25. It's a modern Formula One track, so there's a number of places where you could go just a little bit wide and pick up those incidents going off course. So keep an eye out as drivers will have to uh, keep from uh, overstepping the bounds too often. Looks like of the first laps, Costa actually got beat by Lapisto by half a second, which is highly unusual. But Wanmi is showing improving by almost a second on his second lap. We're just going to have to see how it all plays out here. Following on board the number two, this is anti Lapisto as he starts to dive through some of this elevation that's here at the Mugello circuit and into one of the lowest areas of the racetrack. And it blows my mind how fast these two turns are. I'm checking over 130 miles an hour, and they're just accelerating up through that section. It really is crazy how fast these cars are around here. Costa on his second lap. Here he comes to the timing line. What's it going to be as he crosses it here? 36-6 becomes a 35-4. Massive improvement. Lapisto is still on his second lap. Could he try and... Trump that uh, 135.4 out there. He's got to make up six tenths of a second to do so as he comes down through the scene now and to the main straight. Also, Sam Ryman up to third place. Phenomenal qualifying for him. And we know he likes high down for So maybe that is helping him find some pace here. Lapisto to the line. 34.9. That is going to put him back up to the top by half a second. What a lap right there. That temperature in the tires and the track, it was obviously all working well together. Gernot Frisha now slides into that third place overall. So they're bumping Sam Ryman down the order just a little bit. But I'm with you, Joe. That lap from Ryman, that is a fantastic lap, especially on a high downforce. That should translate into some good race pace. Should indeed. So we'll see if he could... I think maybe take a first podium here on the uh, Sunday Grand Prix series because uh, I don't think he I'll have to check the stats. I'm pretty sure we haven't seen him up amongst them yet. Gernot Frisha, though, is on his second flyer. He tends to wait a little bit to put in his times and, and come in late. He's got plenty of time here to finish this one. And I'm showing him tracking a second to the good compared to his previous lap, which is going to put him close ish to the pole, at least to the front row. I like this kind of um, method about qualifying. You have eight minutes, right? You don't necessarily need to jump in the car and run out there and do your laps. All Gernot has done is he's just taken kind of a breather in the first couple minutes. He let everybody lay down their times. And then guess what? He gets to have that standings just kind of pulled up on his screen. And it just kind of gives him a, an idea of where everybody else is, how fast he really needs to go. Yeah, if he's got the right software, he can see an anticipated lap time. So he kind of knows what to aim for, how hard he needs to push. He'll come to the line as JDS just took fourth behind him. Gernot Frisha will jump ahead one more and go to the front row ahead of Juan Mi Costa. After he has looked like he is almost unbeatable in the past couple rounds, Juan Mi suddenly finds a target on his back. Dylan Freckleton also jumps JDS and moves himself into fourth. I think this is Barry West coming through one of the final sectors of the track, but I just don't think he's got enough time. I mean, only 10 seconds and probably still a half mile to go. Daniel Gallus, on the other hand, he might be able to cross the start finish line here, but it's not going to be a lap time to get him onto the board. Nope, and Gallus uh, has his second lap deleted. It looks like must have had another off track, which means our grid is set for today's second round and anti lapisto puts it on pole that's the two extra bonus points on top of things gernot frisha will start next to him with juan mi costa in p3 dylan freckleton starts fourth today as jack david spickett uh, gets shuffled eventually back to the third row in fifth 
Farron Grau will be P6 as Carl Villeneuve returns to start seventh. Sam Ryman still up in eighth and still an impressive run for him. Uh, Andrew Thomas starts ninth and Sebastian Zahul will be 10th. Jean-Francois Boscus in 11th. George Baitev here in 12th. Yanni Lehman starts in 13th with Kurt Clapper in 14th. Cam Porter with the top 15 qualifying effort. Keith Herner in 16th. Wolfram Fund in 17th. Bjorn Ackerman back here in 18th. Ian Haycox in 19th and Ellis Spice in 20th. Mark Cruikshank will start 21st, followed by Nick Acosta in 22nd. Andrew Fleming, the last one to set a time in 23rd. Barry West, Gallus, Alvarez, Moore, Summers, and Long will be lined up at the back of the grid to try and push their way through. I think we saw Gallus do that last time as well at Road America. So we'll have to see whether or not he can repeat those heroics here today. Good conditions at 83 Fahrenheit, 66 or uh, 28 Celsius rather uh, on the track itself. A little bit of wind, but not dramatic as they should be getting the lights up here momentarily. I think they've got just about everybody on the grid. There we go. We've got the lights coming up as the engines now start to rev for round two of the Sunday Grand Prix series. And the green flag is out as they come off the line. Frisha does not look so hot once again. Costa's already going to get up the inside of him. Coming down into Santonato. Can he take that away? He's going to look all the way for the lead as they go three wide nearly into the first turn. Costa's going to have to back out of it. Looks like Ante is going to be able to lead this first lap as we got a spinner in the mid-pack. It's still too wide, but it's Costa with the late lunge there in turn number two. And now Gernot Frisia goes for a ride all by himself in another car. I think that's Cam Porter going off in the other direction. Unbelievable start to this race. Remember, we saw Gernot do almost the same thing last time at turn five at Road America. You took the words right out of my mouth. Just the cold tires catching out Gernot Frisia one of the most successful in these cars. So it is all anti Lapisto, Juan Costa, Dylan Freckleton, JDS, and Farron Grau, your top five. Wow, some drivers really picked up on this. Crookshanks up 10 positions, Gallus up 13, Jess Moore up 14 spots. And we're not even done with the first lap. Some of the mid-pack drivers have really capitalized on some of the chaos as we watch Gallus currently try and chase on Crookshanks. You were just mentioning this group of drivers. They have essentially leapfrogged about 10 other cars here in the first half lap. So between Gallus, Crookshank right in front of them, Jess Moore and that white car right behind, this group is all on a move. I expected something like this at, at Montreal, not here, as JDS is going to go side by side, fighting for a podium position, coming down through the final turn. He cuts back underneath Dylan who has managed to get himself up to that third spot after those in front of him spun. Who's got the better straight line speed? This is going to tell. All right, so JDS pulled out into clean air, well into this straightaway, and now Freckleton has pulled alongside. So JDS definitely running a little bit of a higher downforce setup. He's going to try to make the long way around, and now he thinks over under, but Freckleton with a really nice job just kind of putting that car right in the middle of the road. Ooh, got so close to the gearbox. And thankfully, they did not make contact. They're used to racing one another. Little bit of wheel spin off the corner from Jack, but he'll manage it. Looks like we got a couple replays here. Let's take a look at Villeneuve. I know was involved in this first incident. Did he start it, though? Oh, he gets hit. Yeah, and I'm not sure which car. And then the number 22 was also collected. So several cars, you're right. They're into turn number one, just day done early. And then we were seeing it between Gernot Frisia on the left side of the racetrack and Cam Porter on the right side of the racetrack here in turn two, there was more red cars off. May have been Andrew Thomas. I'm just checking the paints of those in pit lane and uh, he's got that Ferrari liveried car. As we come back to Cam Porter here to see how he can do trying to recover after what was a pretty decent qualifying for him, but uh, unfortunately he's gonna be sent backwards and down to 25th as ooh, Gernot Frisha already on the charge back forward. This is a battle side by side with Long. He's going to get ahead of him before they get to Biondetti. 
I think we're just going to have to keep an eye on this number three car. Remember, he qualified on the front row, so he's clearly one of the fastest cars. I didn't see any damage in kind of his self-spin, so he's going to be making a lot of passes, just like JDS is trying to get around Freckleton again. But once again, Freckleton with that top speed is able to hold the middle of the road. So JDS is going to have to come up with something. Is it going to be the move here in turn number two? Just not quite far enough up along that rear axle to make that lunge. Jack apparently likes a car that's nimble, but unfortunately that doesn't make it quick. So he's going to have to get creative out here to make that pass eventually. Meanwhile, Daniel Gallus, I mentioned he's going to have to repeat those heroics. He's pretty much already done that. He's up to 12th position. He's already on the attack with Jess Moore in front of him. Nice little three pack here. And then this is Andrew Fleming battling it out with Ellis Spice. And unfortunately, Whoa. you see little spin there. This is live. This is not a replay. So Andrew Fleming gets appointed back the right way and uh, is going to have to kind of get back on the horse now. That's at Luco. That's the second corner. Uh, not really a, a spot that I would have earmarked as, as a difficult turn, but apparently today it's already caught out a couple uh, relatively good drivers. I, I think that if you're running a little bit of a lower downforce setup as we watch fun to look to the inside here of the number 23 car, gets that move done nice and easy there. If you're running that lower downforce, specifically in that turn two, three section, Joe, you also come up over the crest. And if you don't have any kind of additional grip, I can see it easily stepping out there. So Wolfram now, or Wolfram uh, up to 19th rather, and Summers behind him kind of under attack. You can see a little look to the inside from Kurt Clapper. No defense from Ben. He's gonna allow him through. Kurt moves to 20th. And Kurt is actually down quite a few positions, and this is that battle that we were watching down the front straightaway the last couple laps. So this is JDS still trying to get by Freckleton, trying to use this downforce. He's on the wrong side of the road going into the second call at high speed chicane. And once again, just the long way around is not going to work. Oh, but he gets a good exit here. And look at the defensive move from Freckleton, just kind of hovering over to the right side a little bit to dissuade his rival. Farron Grau is also in behind them, not that far back. If they go side by side, he could easily catch up to the pair of them. The UK and I driver going to just stick behind, at least for now, as they come over the crest down into Scarperia. This is the battle for 10th place. So this is Jess Moore chasing Ian Haycox right in front of him in that green and white machine. We were mentioning a couple of those cars really making their way up through the field early. Jess Moore in this white number 21, up 16 positions already. Wow. I think that is the most anybody has gained at, at this stage. I believe Moore was one of those that failed to set a qualifying time. Uh, speaking of which, I had just noticed moments ago, we didn't report Kurt Clapper put a yeah. time in. I, I was reading the grid and I saw him way further up there and I was like, oh, he must have actually put down a qualifying time. <laughs> Highly unusual. We'll, we'll touch on it in a bit. In the meantime, this battle will not go away. Jack continues to try around the outside of turn one into San Donato, but just can't seem to get far enough ahead. Oh, he could stick his nose in up into Luco, though he's going to be able to get side by side, but the outside has better momentum. Freckleton will deny him. Another cutback here. He could have more speed. Freckleton going to hold the left-hand side once again to force him to go the hard way. And it looks like Farron Grau has now joined the party. Yeah, but here we go. JDS, is it going to be a late move? No, he decides to let Freckleton once again just kind of take the middle of the racetrack. But I like what the Pepsi machine is doing right there. If he can continue to keep Freckleton off of the racing line and more of a defensive posture, it's just going to allow the over-unders to carry further down the track, and then eventually an open door is going to happen, and JDS is going to be close enough to take advantage. Trying to race smart here. Dylan's proving to be a pretty nut tough nut to crack, though, at this stage. His growl definitely has joined the fun uh, less than half a second behind them at this stage. Is the slipstream, a double slipstream, really, going to be enough for him to maybe try and make something of it into the first turn here? I think that is a, a good possibility considering the second car in line, JDS, doesn't have the top speed. So 
you're right. If this third car in line, Farron Grau can be close enough. He's not close enough. This lap uh, could potentially take it three wide. This is just going to be another kind of stalled out drag race, right? JDS makes the move. He goes to driver's left, but he doesn't have the top end speed to complete it. He just needs to hang tough around the outside of turn number one and keep Freckleton off of the racing line. He's going to try to do the over under this time. He was playing some mind games, too. He was pinching him down a little bit coming down into the braking zone but it doesn't quite work out. At least he's trying some different things now. Ooh, look at the good run, but he spins the real wheels as he loses grip in the AstroTurf. So that's not gonna do it for him. He'll fall back once more. I actually like what he was doing the previous couple laps when he was trying to get down to the inside of turn number two versus kind of the over under is Ellis Spice makes his way around Nicholas Acosta there for 21st position. Oh, nice battle back. Acosta trying to do the over-under, so this is not over. Spice will at least remain ahead of him. No Acosta, I'm pretty sure, is not related to Juan Mi uh, as uh, he's from New Jersey out there. But behind them, they've also got Cam Porter on his recovery. He's uh, back to 23rd position. Oh, that was a little slip up there from Nicholas but Cam's not going to try it here into Casanova. Well, but he is close enough here. As long as Cam can kind of stay on the gearbox, he'll be right in the game. If that door opens up, especially with Acosta sliding wide from a couple corners ago, it just might provide that opportunity. And here we go up on top of the hill. Not quite close enough, but all you got to do is force Nicholas into a little bit of a mistake, hopefully take advantage from there. Gernot Frisha versus Ian Haycox. Haycox around the outside, coming down through Busin, and then it becomes a drag race once again along the main straight. In fact, they've got another one towing them along up in front. I can report that Spickett almost tried the inside into turn one this time as he went past us down into that first corner. Let's see who's got the guts under breaking. Haycox has the inside, but Frisha is gonna pull ahead. And he crucially is still ahead by the top of the hill here. So he boxes Haycox out on the outside. And look at the gentleman-like racing right there. Leaves plenty of room at, at Apex there. Says, hey, I still noticed you back there. I'm not going to chop the nose on you. Uh, these are both longtime competitors in this car. So oh, a bit of a slip up from Jess Moore in front of him. He's going to be slow up towards Casanova. But Frisha doesn't have the momentum to try and get underneath him. Uh, they're getting a bit of a train forming. Gallus is now at the back of it, and Barry West as well. And Barry West, the big cat back here with the new paint, just kind of the caboose on the train and looking for a way by as Gernot Frisia continues to kind of work his way through this traffic. Barry sees it and says, all right, let's try to follow him through. And apparently that was an actual livery from this era which means this, you know, wasn't just printed on and slapped on as a decal. Somebody had to paint that car, which is impressive. So Barry West going to try and just sit behind, wait for the right opportunity. He's been on an upswing in form lately as oh, Antti Lapisto taking the fastest lap of the race up at the front. So, Joe, since somebody actually had to paint it, do you think that they actually got a lion and put it on a formula car and then had the painter next to it painting the other car? <laughs> Don't they went that far. Maybe they referenced a photo. Ooh, Freckleton once again under threat, this time much farther alongside, coming into Luco. I think we might see something happen here. He cuts back underneath once again. Much better run, but he's going to be on the wrong side once again. Jack David Spickett has been trying everything he can. The kitchen sink hasn't quite worked yet, though. No, and I think that he could have forced the issue, and now he's going to force the issue. He's to the inside of the racetrack here. He boxes Freckleton out. He is going to take the apex away, and all of those laps have now come to fruition. JDS up into third. Took about six corners to make the pass stick, but eventually he got it done. Credit to Jack. That was gutsy stuff. Now, what's going to happen between Grau and Freckleton? Is he also faster than that purple and gray machine? Well, this isn't over yet, Joe. Remember, Freckleton is much faster than JDS on the top end speed, and we're coming up to that front straightaway. So Pepsi machine right here, he better run away real fast because he's only got a couple corners to try to gap it out as much as he can before Freckleton just starts to stalk him down the straightaway. 
Yeah, that's a good point. This could be a difficult day. Could be a headache for Jack Davids pick if he gets repassed right away. Let's see what it's gonna look like. He's now the man in the lead. He pulls a bit of a gap by about six or seven car lengths, but already the number four is starting to reel him in bit by bit. We watch from through the rear wing. It looks a little too far back at this stage though. It does, and I'm looking at the Delta. Freckleton had six miles an hour faster than JDS at the end of the straightaway. Started out at about six tenths, went down to a quarter of a second. So JDS was able to at least gap it out enough. And this is Gurnoff Risha trying to defend off of Jess Moore. Remember, this white car has been moving up through the field, and he's providing quite a battle for Gurnoff. Wow, Moore, despite his lack of qualifying, looks incredibly quick today. He's got the number 21 on his car. He is not intimidated by the number three out there. And look at that, he is gonna defend wherever he needs to. Gernot, I think, is kind of welcoming this too because it's easy to go through kind of the back half of the field, but once you get up towards the front, the passes get more and more difficult. You don't just want to drive by everybody. You still want to race. Loses out a little bit coming up and over through the Arab Arabiatas, but he'll stick with them as the 21 now holds the 10th spot up 17 positions since the start of this race. Definitely is not the race I anticipated us happening, at least until this stage, where now we're kind of seeing the, the difficulty between the low and the high downforce. But boy, it has gotten mixed up since the start. I'm curious, uh, watching Gernot down this front straightaway here, let's see what kind of downforce levels he runs, because he's always one of the smartest when it comes to the race car, and he usually always has it trimmed out, so that way he can make these uh, passes. It also looks like Farron Grau might be trying to make a pass on Freckleton. So here we go, 170 miles an hour, closing it in on Moore. And oh, there is a little bit of a double move right there from Jess. So you got to be careful with that, especially when you're trying to defend here in turn number one. And Gurnoff Frisha takes the long way around. He, oh, and Jess Moore with a big late lunge there in turn number two. He's going to stick it down to the inside, but now contact to the right rear of Gurnoff Frisha. Uh, just pinched down that little bit too much. He gets back onto the racetrack, but he loses almost four positions. Finally stops it before Gallus can sneak by. Barry West, for the second time in a race, is racing against Gernot Frisha again, uh, probably wondering how in the world did I wind up here? And if you ask me, I thought that Gernot, I, it looked like he left plenty of room, but hey, that's a racing incident right there. Just slight contact, thankfully, Gernot was able to save it from going all the way around, for sure. We have lost four cars from this race, for what it's worth. Bjorn Ackerman, Andrew Thomas, Antonio Alvarez, I believe those were all first lap incidents. Then Nick Acosta is also retired from this race. Still 25 of them out and rolling. Mark Krupschenk uh, currently uh, in 17th position right here. He's trying to chase Byron Long, who's gained 13 himself. Another one of those drivers really picking up the pieces. Looks like we got a replay. Is this going to be with uh, Gernot? Yeah, so you, uh, you're saying you think that maybe Jess went out a little bit here? This is pretty aggressive on the outside of the racetrack once Gernot has made that. And I, I mean, yeah, it just looks like maybe a little bit of understeer from Jess Moore. I don't think it was intentional that he went over there and hit Gernot, but there is definitely plenty of racing room that Frisha left on the inside. Yeah, so I, I'd say racing incident, honestly, just two drivers racing hard, the slightest little drift, and unfortunately, open wheelers do not like to touch wheel to wheel. Barry West still behind Freesha, well, now behind Freesha as he's re-overtaken him once again, and he's got a repass Ian Haycox. And actually, have they already caught Jess Moore, too? Yeah, so Jess Moore wasn't that far out in front, and... This was kind of like a four pack, five pack. I was actually really excited because I thought that Jess Moore and Frisia could have gone up there and caught Jean, uh, Jean-Francois Boscus, who's right behind Yanni Lehman. So really this mid pack, call it from eighth to 15th or so, it, there's a couple seconds between some of these cars, but they're relatively close together. They can see everybody. Curious what this lap is gonna look like, because I also wonder if, if maybe Jess got a little bit of damage uh, that uh, has cost him some pace, because it certainly seems like Ian 
is gaining very fast now, putting the pressure on. But Pisto and Costa have been trading those fastest laps back and forth, but they've been staying at about two seconds apart, so there's really not much action up there. That's why we haven't been showing them. Uh, this is really where all the fun is. Here we go. It's going to get even more fun because let's see who's got the straight line speed. They are all lined up right here. It's going to be Gernot Frisha already making the move on Ian Haycox. But guess what? Ian's got the power of the draft following in the tire tracks of that white car right in front of him. That's just a headache for Gernot Frisha. So Ian Haycox on the inside. Gernot Frisha once again going the long way around. He likes that move into turn number one. And he should be able to box out Haycox here in turn two. Does he leave plenty of room? Yes, he does. Even extra room for Haycox there. It <laughs> doesn't want to make the same mistake twice, but both Ian and Gerna are pretty fair racers. Uh, they both want to try and get to the end of this one. Round two, ring the bell. It's Jess Moore versus Gernot Frisia. Last time it wound up in contact. What's he going to do this time? And you brought up a really good point, Joe. I, I didn't see any damage on Jess Moore's car, but remember a lot of the speed from these cars comes from the underside so if he's banged a curb or something it could be damaged and we not even know yeah and the last lap was a 38 2 his fastest is a 37 8 so if he does have damage i don't think it's that significant he's running still a decent pace it's just i guess those behind him are pretty quick right now and swinging out wide looks like gernot may be trying to get a little air on the front of that car as he runs slightly offline. They do have quite the arrow wake on the back of these machines. Just more, once again, just right in the middle of the road, defending from Frisia. So Gernot's going to have to go the long way around. He says, okay, I got this. I'm going to take that driver's right side of the track. You better not squeeze me down there. And I think there's the top end speed difference. Gernot Frisia already just kind of driving by just more. But here comes the top end from the 21 back. Gernot Frisia has the inside, though, this time. Oh, nearly touching wheels coming down into the braking zone. Gernot finds the apex. I think maybe it's job done this time. Yep, he is through. And that's up to 10 for all that work just to get back into the top 10. Jess is holding on close to the gearbox, though. He's not letting him get away. Now, Gernot had a little bit of that red mist come over and down his helmet after he got knocked off into that gravel. The previous lap from Gernot, a 37.1. That was his fastest lap of the race. If that's not motivation to get back in the fight, I don't know what is. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, passing around the outside of Boussine as well. <laughs> I mean, he's, he said, all right, if you're going to make life hard in the first few corners, I'll do it somewhere else. Barry West just behind them, uh, uh, chasing on Ian Haycox for 12th position right now. This train has not gone away now that uh, Gernot has worked his way to the front of them. Up at the very front though, Antti Lapisto. Uh, now at actually about two and a half seconds. So he is running away from Costa, just maybe about a 10th or two a lap. I'll give it to Juan Mee though, because he has not let Antti just completely run away. Yes, it's about 2.2, 2.3 seconds, but we've seen it from this driver right here, even just one tire oh. off the racetrack and there was contact between Jean-Francois Boskis, and I couldn't make out who that car was behind him, but heavy damage to this yellow number uh, 15, I think. Yeah, it went a little bit wide, and, and oh, it was Jess Moore again with more contact, but I, I can't blame Jess on this one. I mean, the car was way to the outside. He had better speed. He kept it down to the apex. I think just Jean-Francois did not expect a car to suddenly be there. Unfortunate, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, some contact late in a corner that goes on forever along there. And looks like we're going to get the GSRC replay of exactly what happened. Joe, I'm going to agree with you on this one. If we watch this yellow car of Boscus, he's just way on the outside of the track and then comes down on the racing line. But guess what? More is already there. Yeah, so I wondered how he got there and. I've never seen the entire side pod get knocked off like that. That was an interesting bit of damage for the car. Certainly going to make it life difficult. It, it, that must be part of the new damage model as Ian Haycox is now making a, a, a look. I was just agreeing with you. I've never seen the whole thing fall off like that. I do like what it's, it's done uh, with this car and the way it drives and also just how it looks when they're racing. 
But uh, Ian Haycox took a big look on Jess Moore, like you said, just couldn't quite manage to get inside of him. He's done that a couple times up uh, at the top of that hill. And I'm not sure if he's just trying to get in their heads or if he's actually trying to make a legitimate move. I got to believe that Jess Moore is driving a damaged car now. You brought it up when Gurnoff Risha just kind of caught him so quickly and then just drove away from him. And now everybody's stacked up behind him. He's got to be dealing with something inside the cockpit. Yeah, 38-7 on the last couple laps. Usually they, they pick up pace as the race goes on. So it does look like there's something that's slowing him down. Not hugely, but just enough that unfortunately everybody else is going quicker and he's just kind of staying the same pace. And the reason why they're all stacked up is because, oh, there's a big jump over the curbs from Jess Moore. That's gonna allow an opportunity for Haycox. Does Barry West make it three wide? He thought about it, but once again, Moore is able to defend. This track's so tough with no real slow corners. Everything is all medium speed around here and these cars need that heavy braking to try to make the passes. So Haycox regroups, tries to size him up once again. Gallus also back there as well. They got to be careful. I mean, there have been some, so I wouldn't say sloppy incidents out here, but there's definitely been some contact today that I was not expecting. And the more these drivers get involved with one another, the more we see a likelihood that we could have more wrecks. And, and quite honestly, the more that I watch that white 21, Joe, I'm convinced it's got to be underside damage that we are missing on the car because he's jumping over the apex curbs quite a bit on a lot of these high speed chicane switchbacks, you know, whatever you want to call them. So I just have a feeling lap after lap after lap, eventually Whoa. something's going to happen. Yeah, Barry West almost into the back of Haycox there. Wow, that was a dive. And thankfully, they did not make contact. I thought Ian was going to be more concerned catching Jess Moore. No, he's on the defense. Barry West with good speed down the main straight. And he's pulling along Daniel behind him in that number 14. Are both positions going to go away for Ian Haycox? He's going to break as deep as he dares. They are going to make a little bit of contact up through the first corner. And he loses control of the car. Yes, he loses both positions. The big cat getting the claws out there in turn number one. And unfortunately, Ian Haycox, you're right, just had a little bit of a side check there at turn in. Barry West and Daniel Gallus take the spots. They still have to catch up to Jess Moore, though. And, and you can see they're still with him here, probably because of the suspected damage. Oh, did Jess just have a slip up because suddenly he was right behind him? It is kind of reminiscent of that move into turn 15, that last lap, Joe. I just think that Barry West maybe is confident on the brakes in the first third of the corner. He's making huge lunges. I think there was maybe a bit of a slowdown penalty that Jess had as well, because you don't really have to lift and brake for that corner, and he gave away a ton of time. So we'll watch them through the rest of the lap here. Again, if the straight line speed, oh, we're actually going to check out... Uh, Kurt Clapper, and honestly, one of my favorite paints, uh, as uh, he chases on 16th place, Jean-Francois Boscus, who has less than a whole car, and he's not going to fight it. Yeah, you see Kurt just kind of drive right on by, and we're used to seeing Kurt Clapper up the positions. He's actually down two positions from where he started, but remember, he qualified. The round of applause, that is something that we usually don't see out of the Clapper boys. Yeah, so... Uh, I wonder what changed it here. Maybe it, it's because it is so hard to pass here. He figured might as well. Single split? That's true, too. Yeah. I don't know. This, uh, this is a bit of a mystery. So Yana Lehman, in the meantime, uh, out here in the number 12, and he's chasing on Sebastian Zahul. I haven't really talked about Seb at all this race, but uh, both he and Yanni are up a couple positions. Gernot Frisha, though, is down seven, and he's rocked up to the back of him. I think that as soon as Gernot sees the open door, it might even come right here at the top of the hill. Is he close enough to Lehman? No, not quite. So most likely it'll happen down the front straightaway here. It's really difficult to get the run coming out of this fifth switchback on the course. Don't worry, there's another one coming up after this right-hander here in case you needed another one on the track. But Gernot Risha just slowly and methodically putting down laps, catching car after car, taking the positions. It's kind of what he did last week, too, although he made it all the way up to third. This time, 
He is about 20 seconds away from third, so I don't think we'll see another podium out of him, which is unfortunate because he has seemed quick here today, but kind of mistake prone at the opening. I'm not sure if this car is just a little unwieldy on cold tires as he gets a good run. And we're seeing a bit of a defense from Lehman coming up to the first corner. We've seen this story again and again, who breaks deeper into San Donato. This time it's gonna be Frisha. He really does like that outside lane around and he's got that move. You, you can tell he's practiced it. He's comfortable out there on the racetrack. And also in turn one, it is uphill, slightly banked. So he's just using everything that the track is offering and just taking advantage. And now the next one on the list is gonna be Zahul right in front of him. Gonna have to start calling him Harry Gant Frisha. Likes that high, wide and handsome line as we had a bit of smoke, not sure, or dust or something, not sure what it was from, but uh, Barry West back on the fight with Jess Moore. So whatever slowed down Jess before, he seems to have uh, at least gotten a bit of a handle on things because he's held back that number eight for a couple laps now. The other one that I want to look at real fast is look at Sam Ryman has crawled up on the back of Farron Grau. Now, I don't know if Farron might have had a mistake a, a little bit earlier this lap, but we talked about how great the qualifying was from this number nine car. He's all the way up into sixth place and doing a great job in the race. Well, uh, there is just another bobble from Farron Grau down through this corner. So yeah, I think that car is not in the best of shape here. Zahul uh, currently going to be chased, or no, Frisha got by him. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> So now Bernard Frisha, four and a half seconds up the road, is the two cars that we were just mentioning between Farron and Sam. And if they start battling or if Farron is having problems with that red uh, number five, it's just going to slow them both down. It might give Bernard Frisha an opportunity to go up there and maybe even get a top five. Yeah, so definitely making more progress than I anticipated. Looks like uh, we've got a replay here. So let's take a look. Is this that pass? for Gurnaut. No, this is fair and growl. So here's where maybe that mistake. Oh, it was the curb once again. Almost, yes, he does do almost a full 360 and uh, we'll get it back pointed forward. So watch out for those sausage curves at this track. This car does not like them. Between the aerodynamics and just the extremely stiffly sprung package, yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you want to keep the um, Call it the platform level at all times. And as soon as you go bouncing over the curbs, it unevens that platform and the grip all of a sudden goes away. Andy Lapisto lays down another purple fastest lap at 35.527 as we continue to watch Farron Grau be stopped by Sam Ryman. And Gurnoff Risha has already closed that gap down to two and a half seconds between himself and Sam. Yeah, Sam is going to have to start watching the mirrors a little bit here. Gernot Frisha coming up quickly to try and see if he can crack into those top five in the last few laps of this race. In fact, it's, uh, I think, seven laps to go, maybe about six and a half at this stage with the pistol already well farther up the road. What about Barry West versus Moore? Here we go again. And looking for the inside line, Jess Moore going to make him try to do the uh, Gernot Frisha line. Barry might try it. Yeah, he's going to stick to the outside. He carries the speed, doesn't quite have the nose in, and he's going to uh, be given space at turn two at least, but can't quite hold on to it. Oh, and then he just got a little bit of a loose moment there as he switched back to the right. I thought that he could have done an over-under, but just the loss of traction out of the back end of the car prevented that run from happening for Barry West. So not only Barry West, but remember, Daniel Gallus has been on the back of this. He's the third car in line, that black car in that JPS kind of livery there. So Jess Moore had a better first half than a second half, and I firmly believe that he's dealing with a wounded car out there, and he's doing a terrific job holding these two back, but with only six laps to go, I'm sure Barry's going to be looking for another way around. I mean, even if he had a better first half, you look at the positions gained, he's still up yep. 17 right now. So, I mean, this is a race for him to be proud of. Yes, maybe there's some opportunities missed in a couple places, but... He's been doing fantastic, and he's been showing incredible defense. Uh, I, yes, 
100% agree. He started way back in 27th place back there. So, yeah, made more uh, kind of headway at the beginning half than the second half here, but has been action-packed the entire time. Sam Ryman is now less than a second ahead of Frisha. That last lap, Gernot ran a 35-3. Sam, a 36-7. He is gobbling up that time. And before you know it, he's going to be on the back of the GSRC car. Well, that lap from Frisha, that is the fastest lap of the race. Our leader has only done a 35.5. So, yeah, this red and white Marlboro theme, number three car, it definitely had the speed. Another story of what if. Even still, he's given us some fun to watch at the very least, uh, some entertainment for today's race. Should be uh, getting close enough to strike soon, I would imagine, unless the arrow wake is going to make it tough by the time he reaches Sam Ryman. The unfortunate news is, as we've mentioned, Sam likes a car with a lot of downforce in it. So if they get to the front stretch, Gernot, I'm expecting, will be much faster. There's a little wiggle heading down into Corian Tau from Sam. I think um, your foreshadowing hit the nail on the head. Even right here, look at the top end speed difference between the two cars. And I think Sam Ryman just pulled it right on over to the left side of the road, said, Gernot, you are much faster than me. Let me take some notes. Absolutely. Well, and, and maybe you could pull a little slipstream here down the main straight too. Uh, this might be a bit far away, unfortunately. Should have stayed uh, a tad closer. Frisha now up to six, two and a half seconds to catch up to Grau. Grau's last lap was a 36-1. Frisha a 35-3. I think this is doable. I mean, Gernot has just set two purple laps right after each other. And actually, no, I am wrong. Anti Lapisto just laid down a 35.2. So it's Gernot with two personal bests back to back. And he is the second fastest car on the racetrack. And we've seen that often that towards the end of the race, Gernot likes a car that that kind of comes alive in the final laps, gets very, very fast, it makes him hard to beat. And you can see also makes it hard to defend from. But unfortunately, he wasn't close enough uh, during the race to try and really make it uh, a better finishing position. Juan Mikosta, though, started off with a win, looking like that won't be the case today as, as it sits right now. He's about four and a half seconds back from Antti Lapisto. Antti with uh, an excellent qualifying lap. He was congratulated by Juan Mi and his competitors for that poll, and he's backed it up with what has been a, a pretty clinical race. It's kind of been a little bit of a lonely race for the top four, really, between Lapisto, Costa, JDS, and even Freckleton. Remember, those two in third and fourth had an early battle, but ever since, they've just kind of been out there running their own pace, just like Juan Mi Costa has, and it can be a tough race as a driver when you're doing that. You don't necessarily have the adrenaline going of the focus of having to make the move the next corner, and your mind can start to wander, so even though these are uh, kind of boring races for these drivers, they still provide a mental challenge, and you got to be on top of it every single lap. Gernot with a 35-1. Who's going to be the first to break that 35 mark? Because they're getting very, very close out there. And yeah, he's definitely one of, if not the fastest at times on the track here in these last few laps. But uh, Jack David Spickett, it's a good thing he got by Freckleton when he did, because he's definitely pulled away from him. He could have been stuck behind him like we've seen many a driver uh, wind up in this race and he's going to be rewarded with a podium as it sits. Uh, now, let's knock on some wood over here because remember one week ago when JDS was sitting in this exact same position and then Canada Corner oh, yeah. struck on the final lap. So hopefully the Pepsi machine can keep it together this week for a podium. Uh, I'm glad you reminded me. Apologies if I just cursed the poor guy. Also, Barry West uh, had an off. Don't need a replay. Just, I think, maybe dipped his wheels in the dirt uh, under braking and wound up going off into the gravel. He falls to 14th. Boscus uh, dealing with uh, a, a partial car here is down to 21st. Oh, Jess Moore's off track. Did he get the wall? He's close to the barriers. He's getting it going at least. I do not think that he hit the wall, Joe, and this wasn't from any other contact with anybody else. This was just 
a self-inflicted spin on the corner exit of one of the switchbacks here. And I don't know if this actually started at apex or it just looks loose on exit. And then the big old tank slapper thankfully stops before those tires though. Yeah, and I, I thought maybe it would be the curb, but yeah, you could see from that replay angle already the rear was hanging out before he even reached uh, the, the curbs here. Yana Lehman, we've been checking in on him every once in a while. He's got Sebastian Sahul just in front of him. And I think uh, they're, let's see, looks like, yeah, they just started lap here to go because I was kind of curious who amongst the two of them has the better straight line speed. They're behind Sam Ryman by roughly four seconds here, so might be a bit far back to catch up to him. It's going to be between these two. And they're pretty even in terms of their fastest lap and also the pace that they're running. This number 12 is catching Zahul right in front of them. Just kind of taking out maybe a tenth of every single corner. So Yanni Lehman with call it two and a half laps to go here for this group. Just kind of doing what he can. Just needs to get a little bit closer and then he can start to posture where he wants to put the car on the racing line. Two laps left to go, and Gurnot has limited opportunities here. That is Farron just in front of him. I think he might get a little slipstream down the main straight, but not a lot of it. He's definitely way too far back to attack into San Donato, but he could use this as a chance to cut it down. You say that, but I mean, he's already seven miles an hour faster on the top end. He went from nine tenths of a second down to four tenths of a wow. second just on that front straightaway alone. That is what's called a fast race car. Not only is he the first to break the 35 mark, he hit a 34.6. He absolutely smashed the fastest lap. Nobody else has done that this lap. Maybe we'll see Lapisto and Costa do that if they really want to take those two bonus points because there are points at hand for that fastest lap. I don't think it's going to be possible, Joe. I think that lap was a perfect or close to a perfect lap from Gurnup. Plus, he got the slipstream from a car right in front of him. Oh, there's a lap car right off. Thankfully, it doesn't affect these two. But I think that Gurnup's lap was helped by probably three tenths just slipstream alone. I think Farron's trying to make use of that extra downforce. He's gotten it back up to half a second. So he's trying his best to run away where he knows he's strong, plunging now down into uh, Corian Tao. He regains some of that time. He's getting frighteningly close to that red number five. Oh, and I can tell you three and a half tenths entering turn number 15 here for Gernot Frisha. He closes it down to a quarter of a second. I think this is going to be close enough to make the move on the straightaway. It's looking like it. I think that for Farron Grau is going to be a sitting duck on this one. Gernot Frisha just rocks up next to him. Look at the extra speed. He's going to have the nose ahead. He's going to be fully ahead by the braking zone. And we already know he knows how to make this outside line work. Farron's going to fight him for it, make him work hard. But no, the McLaren liveried machine. Oh, there he comes right back at him. Holy cow. Farron Grau through turn two suddenly dashes ahead. And now Frisha's on the wrong side of the road. So he's going to have to go the long way around. And we've seen it just doesn't work in that second switchback. The first switchback has so much more grip up over the crest of the hill, provides that run for the outside lane, but half a lap to settle it here. That was one of the savviest defenses I've seen. Growl with a, a beautiful move as we come down to the last corner for Anti Lapisto. What a response. He got beat at Road America. He has replied with aplomb as he comes around to take the win here at Mugello for round two in the Sunday Grand Prix series. Juan Mi Costa was able to close it into two seconds in that gap. He finishes second. JDS about 10 seconds behind, but the race for what is fifth place still on. And honestly, Joe, I think that Grau's got, or uh, that Gurnock's got the top end speed. Here comes a move into 15. Oh, I was going to say, maybe he doesn't want to try and pass there because, yeah, I think he could be past him by the start finish line if he gets the right exit. Here we go. He's pulling on him. Where is that finish line? They're coming up to it now. He's got a big run. It's going to be close, but no, he is just shy by a half a tenth of a second. And this is Jess Moore back in the fight after that little bit of an off earlier. He's trying to get by Keith Herner for what will be 11th place. So 
Jess in that white car on the outside. Driver's right, trying to take the long way around. This is going to be another drag race between Herner and Moore. Who's got the top end speed? It looks like Jess Moore is going to take it away at the end. Pulls ahead, another very close finish between them. Just one tenth of a second, almost exactly at the line as Gallus will get himself up into 13th in the end after starting from 25th. And Kurt Clapper's qualifying and a, a weird twist is actually not going to do him any better as he loses two positions. What a race we saw. Cam Porter coming around the final turn number 15. He's going to cross the line in 18th place. And oh, holy smokes, I thought it was exciting at Road America. This was phenomenal. But we're going to take a quick break. We'll have more show coming your way, including the unofficial results as well as driver interviews. So stick around after the break. Welcome back to Mugello. We saw quite the race out there today and up at the top of it, Anton Lepisto had perhaps one of the more dull ones of everybody as he ran away with the win. It wound up two seconds, but he definitely was managing things by the end. Costa was all the way down to almost five seconds behind partway through this race. Jack David Spickett was a bit of a distance back, but claims a podium as he fought hard with Dylan Freckleton in the first half of the race. Dylan still got himself fourth place. Farron Grouse squeaks through with a top five over Gernot Frisia, who made a late pass attempt and maybe could have cost him 
but would have been in fifth place since he had straight line speed, but didn't have enough to get him at the line. Sam Ryman with uh, an excellent qualifying of eighth, winds up seventh as Sebastian Zahul winds up eighth. And then Yana Lehman was ninth. Ian Haycox goes from 19th to 10th. Then Jess Moore had a good day up 16 positions. I think he could have been up a couple more if it wasn't for that little spin that he had. Keith Herner finishes in 12th, also a good day for him. Daniel Gallus up 12 to finish 13th. Barry West in that paint scheme finishes in 14th, up 10 positions. Mark Cruikshank, look at all of these drivers, up six to finish in 15th. Kirk Claffer in 16th spot. Wolfram Fund here in 17th. Cam Porter in 18th. Ellis Spice 19th and Ben Summers finishes 20th. Byron Long was 21st as Jean-Francois Boscus limped the car home to 22nd. Kind of impressive considering how much damage he had. Uh, Carl Villeneuve was 23rd as Andrew Fleming wound up two laps down 24th. And Batev, I think, may have had a late retirement. He was five laps down, finished 25th. Everybody from there on down did not see the end of the race. Nick Acosta, Antonio Alvarez, Andrew Thomas, and Bjorn Ackerman. As uh, I think we've got our second place finisher ready to talk to us, Juan Mi Costa, who couldn't quite keep the pace with Anti Lapisto here today, but still looked plenty fast. Juan Mi, you two were up there trading fast laps for a bit of time, but it looked like Anti just maybe had a bit of legs over you today. Yeah, today he was very fast. Today. I don't know what what excuse can I use today, but he had. Uh, better set up with more downforce I so I gained him every time on the straight three times two times three times and I couldn't do nothing in the, in the corners and I saw in, in, in the Monday practice we make so some usuals here on the series uh, I saw we make sometimes I, I couldn't match so I pretty know I pretty much know I had to to be on the podium for the Sunday yeah, it still made the best of the situation, it, it seems. What was your approach on the setup of the car? Because we talked about it a lot, how there's so many fast corners, but at the same time, if you want to pass, you kind of need to be quick on that that pitch straight. Yeah, I think I did a mistake there because last season when I won, even anti was faster, but I had more downforce that time. I... I did a mistake of putting, focusing more on the little bit of more front uh, top speed, and I think it no, it's not worth it. You have to put a ton of downforce. Well, we're, we're going to another track that, that has a lot of long sweeping corners in Barcelona. Uh, have you learned anything this time that you can apply to there to try and beat Anti next time? Uh, I don't. It's hard to say now. What? It will really, be. Almost the same style of setup. So maybe try to put some more down for this thing. Well, we'll we'll keep an eye on that and, and see if it works out for you. Still, congratulations on a podium. Yeah, thank you. Amazing win for Anti and great podium for Jack again. Behind him, finishing fourth, we've got Dylan Freckleton. Joey has caught up with a man that definitely fought hard to try and stay in those top three. Yeah, well, Dylan, congratulations on the fourth place finish today here at Mugello. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun um, and a good fight for sort of the first 10 laps or so. Um, that was a lot of fun. That's exactly what I was going to ask you about. It seemed like a, a little bit of a lonely race after that. However, how was the scrap with JDS? Yeah, really fun. Um, I did the race on Wednesday evening uh, and I was racing JDS in that. I knew he was quicker than me, um, but I knew he couldn't get me down the main straight. Um, I think I must have been running a bit less wing. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I can just keep him behind, but, you know, fair play to him. He's a really smart racer. Um, and he kind of kept pushing me all through that first part of the lap. And then it's just sort of one mistake and he's able to get there. Um, and then once he got past, I just couldn't stay with him. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And for me, I'm really happy with the pace I had, particularly towards the end. Like I was tracking what the fastest lap was and I was just sort of like a couple of tenths off. Just like, just need a little bit more uh, and I could be there. But uh, in the end, you know, happy with where the pace was and fourth was the best I could have done. What is it like when you're going up against one of those cars that it's got a completely different downforce level than you? Are you 
maybe kind of posturing in certain areas and then not in other areas? Well, what's that kind of like to both attack and defend a card that's the same but totally different? It's, yeah, you've got to be sort of really smart about it, both from sort of the defending card's point of view and the attacking card's point of view. For me, it was just sort of focusing on not making mistakes through sort of most of the lap and then just nailing the exit out of the last corner just to make sure that he could get alongside but not past and then I was going quite deep on the brakes into turn one um, but yeah and then I think from Jack's perspective I think he was just making sure he was right on my tail through the sort of the chicane bit um, and then as soon as I made a little mistake went a bit deep compromised my exit out one of them he was straight up the inside and he just pounced on it so fair play to him well, Dylan, thank you for coming out and racing with us, and congrats on that fourth place finish. Thank you very much. That was Dylan Freckleton, driver of the number four today. And following him home in seventh, it was Sam Ryman, who definitely wowed us with his qualifying. Sam, you know, we, we, we harp on it a lot, but you're kind of known for liking tracks with a lot of downforce. This is a place where you can probably get away with that. Were you just really feeling in the zone here today? I had a lot of motivation, uh, a lot of motivation, a lot of determination to try and get a good result uh, this week, Joe, because last week was not a good race for me. Um, you know, there was that, uh, the start where there were five cars crashing before the first turn. I didn't cause that. The car in front uh, spun his wheels and slid in front of me, but obviously uh, some people were blaming me for, like, triggering that incident, and certainly had my car not been there, it wouldn't have happened. And then later through the lap, I just ran over the back of Ian Haycox. Um, I apologised to him after the race. I have a couple of excuses, but, you know, at the end of the day, I just ran over him. So I've had that hanging over my shoulders all week, you know, that I'm normally a, a cleaner driver in this series, and uh, I definitely, in these three SRC colours, by the way, the car is called Thursday now, I, I could explain that, the last, yeah, okay, um, but anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I've had that hanging over me all week, and I did an AI race uh, where I made a couple of setup tweaks, um, I, uh, you know, and this is my third race of a weekend here. And I, I just really wanted to get a clean race in. I, I knew that part of getting a clean race in was going to be qualifying well. And I was able to do that. So this is a massive weight off of the shoulders. I'm going to be broadcasting this race for GSRC next week. So I'm kind of glad I can go into that knowing that this is a race I'm coming off of r rather than the one at Road America. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm stealing time from other people I know uh, who wanted to talk to you, but um, I, I just, you know, want to get it out there that I feel bad about the opening lap of Road America last week, and I'm glad that I can finally show my face in public again now that we're back on form. I'd say, yeah, you redeemed yourself because this this was an excellent one out there. Uh, you, you saw Gernot Frisia coming up behind him. I didn't see any fight from you, which is not too much of a surprise coming from you. But uh, were you were you plenty happy to when you saw him approach from from the rear to just let him through? Uh, so I have a TVO open on my top monitor. And when I realized I had about three or four seconds over the car that was in seventh, I think it was Sebastian, I started looking down the list and I saw Gerno in 12th. And I'm like, I got to keep an eye on that. And then there was one lap when I, I think a couple of cars in front of him spun off and he went from being nine seconds behind me to seven seconds behind me. And I'm like, I'm finishing seventh. <laughs> Well, uh, again, uh, like I said, we were very impressed by your qualifying, and, and I'd say that was a very well clean run race. Anybody you want to thank before we go? Uh, well, I don't have 4D race wear on the car anymore, but they make some good uh, gloves and everything. I've been, uh, I was running their livery last season in uh, in the Lionheart series, so give them a shout out in case they continue to sponsor me when Lionheart comes back next year. Until then, you know, uh, GSRC um, and, and the community, you know, we are all to get together, the fundies races, uh, shared setups, uh, the, the setup I was running was a shared setup with a few personalized tweaks run to it. So, no, it's just a good community and uh, glad we got the put on the good show for uh, fans. Great stuff. That was Sam Ryman finishing seventh today. And I believe uh, we are going to wrap up with that one. So we also want to thank the Lotus 79 community for bringing us back for another season of coverage. And also thank you to the team today, Joey, Daniel, and Dougie. 
Make sure to check out our social media, our website, and our merchandise store. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a moment here on GSRC. Next race will be Barcelona Sunday, March 31st at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. But we have other broadcasts coming up, including later today, the MX-5 World Sim Series is at both Brands Hatch and VIR. That'll be at 4.50 p.m. Eastern. Until next time, though, race clean, race hard. We'll see you on the track. Thank you.